Greetings, everyone. Good evening. My name is Jim Goldston, and I'm the uh, director of the Open Society Justice Initiative. I want to thank everyone for joining this evening. OSF's president, Patrick Gaspard, our esteemed panelists, the event organizers, and uh, all of you who've taken the time to join us. More than 15 years ago, in the activist spirit of our founder's political philanthropy, the Open Society Foundations established the Justice Initiative as an in-house legal center to protect, defend, and promote a culture of respect for human rights and the rule of law. Through litigation in national and international courts and advocacy and research, we use the power of law in the service of justice to democratize access to legal institutions, to lift up the agency of the marginalized, to fight for true equality. From our earliest days, the Justice Initiative recognized the vital importance of citizenship in making effective the promise of fundamental rights. And we have seen how around the world, from ethnic Nubians in Kenya to persons of Haitian descent in the Dominican Republic, from the Rohingya of Myanmar to the Badoon of Kuwait, citizenship has been politically manipulated, arbitrarily denied, and rendered a tool of exclusion on grounds of race and ethnicity and gender. In recent years, similar patterns of othering have emerged here in the United States. And so we felt compelled to document the different ways in which citizenship is under threat in this country. In the United States, deprivation of nationality used to be reserved for war criminals or others who committed heinous crimes. Today, it is a radical political weapon increasingly deployed against vulnerable individuals through unchecked bureaucratic measures. The report that we are discussing this evening covers three aspects of what amounts to a new policy of unmaking American citizens. First, denaturalization, the deprivation of citizenship from naturalized Americans through civil and criminal proceedings. Secondly, the denial or revocation of passports from US citizens. And thirdly, and perhaps most insidiously, the recurring rhetorical attacks by this administration and its surrogates on the 14th Amendment's grant of citizenship acquired by birth on US territory. Today, Constitution Day and Citizenship Day is a particularly appropriate moment to consider these abuses. We thank you for joining us and welcome you to this conversation about the history and meaning of American citizenship and the power to take it away. And let me please introduce OSF's president, Patrick Gaspard. Thank you so much, Jim, for welcoming me into this important convening here this evening. Thank you to all who are in attendance, who are uh, fellow uh, travelers in the quest for justice. Uh, thank you, Jim, for your extraordinary leadership of our justice uh, initiative. And thank you to all of our colleagues in JI uh, for the work that you do every single day, but most especially uh, for the work that culminates uh, in this impressive uh, and timely uh, report. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Jim and I were having a conversation about the work of the justice initiative and particularly the work that J.I. has taken up uh, over the course of 15 years uh, on the question of uh, citizenship. Uh, and in that discussion, uh, it occurred to us that we were, of course, uh, in a new environment in the United States, uh, an environment where, as Jim noted, some were exploiting the question of citizenship and naturalization uh, to lift up sweeping changes uh, to weaken citizenship for some, uh, and to strengthen it for a select few. And at that time, Jim suggested that it might uh, make a lot of sense for J.I. to reorient and to focus its beacon here uh, at home uh, to conduct research and ultimately, potentially, uh, some potent litigation to take up these issues. So what's been the trajectory uh, that we have found ourselves on? First, of course, we remember in the very first days of uh, this administration that we had the travel bans, uh, followed immediately thereafter by the family separations. Uh, and then 
uh, dramatically, tragically, we were faced every single day uh, in the evening news uh, with children in cages. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we had uh, the echo of the cries from a uh, divisive campaign where public policy and public resources were being turned towards the creation of a border wall. Uh, then we had the movement against the DACA, refugee li limits, uh, and then, of course, perversely, questions about citizenship in the United States censorship, uh, uh, census, sorry, and then the public charge rules. Uh, all of us, of course, have been uh, outraged uh, about this, as we've seen U.S. citizens, U.S. citizens who have been detained illegally in immigration detention centers, uh, and now. Uh, we're faced with attacks against equal citizenship that are the next steps in an all-out campaign against immigrants and citizens that this administration picks and chooses as outsiders. Uh, this is a question that um, you might imagine with a name like uh, uh, Gaspar, uh, and a little bit of my history, if you, if you Google any of it, you know this is near and dear to me. Uh, I came to the United States uh, as a um, someone whose family uh, were refugees first uh, from Haiti, then refugees from uh, the uh, Democratic Republic of uh, the Congo, found ourselves here uh, in America with little means, little resources, but a community that would take us uh, uh, in uh, and helped us to find ourselves, to center ourselves in uh, the American uh, ideal, uh, eventually, eventually uh, becoming full uh, citizens of this country. But as the Trump administration launched its most recent attack against uh, citizens who, uh, who have been naturalized, who uh, have uh, been on public service, I thought about my family uh, and our reliance on the food stamp program, uh, our inability to house ourselves, to clothe ourselves, to educate ourselves without the active participation not only of community, uh, but uh, of uh, government. So uh, you can well imagine that this question uh, hits uh, near uh, to home, uh, and the advocacy of this organization on these issues uh, is one that makes me just terribly proud to uh, be able to serve uh, as president. Uh, this report uh, arrives at just the right time. Uh, it's, uh, it's been written uh, exactly because we wanted to situate this uh, administration's horrific policies in the wider context of an effort to refashion immigrant communities into scapegoats uh, and to stir up xenophobia and to link foreignness with criminality. We need this report and stronger public awareness about what's happening in our citizenship system from the border to customs houses right straight up to the White House. Citizenship rights should not wane from one politician to another. Uh, it should not matter who the current occupant of the White House is. This is about democracy. Ultimately, any efforts to undermine equal citizenship is an attempt to limit who has access to fundamental rights like voting. Let's not get this twisted, my friends. This is about voting. This is about access to the franchise. This is about uh, finding ways to co-opt and exploit um, uh, democratic uh, practice in ways that will accrue to the electoral benefit of some. Don't let anyone let you think it's about anything but that. Uh, but this is not anything that's new uh, in America. Uh, throughout the collective history of uh, this nation, citizenship and belonging in America has been twisted into barbed wire. We, of course, have uh, the original sin in America, whose 400th anniversary we, we observed with the arrival uh, and the creation of a slave underclass in America. Uh, eventually, that African-American population was denied not only its fundamental humanity, but even after emancipation, through reconstruction, denied a fundamental citizenship. Uh, and uh, we know, of course, that it took the active work of a citizen movement uh, to begin to bend that arc. Uh, but we've seen this barbed wire expressed in so many ways against so many groups uh, in the history uh, of America. We have in the 1880s the Chinese Exclusion Act, which explicitly denied naturalization for all those of Chinese origin. That noose was further tightened in 1923, when the constitutional term free white persons 
was interpreted in this democracy to rule out those who were from Japanese and South Asian uh, origin who were here as laborers in America. If you know your history, if you know the history of the Great Depression, you know that on the ground there was a fierce, exploited contest of working class Americans at the height of the Great Depression. And in the Hoover administration, 1.7 million Mexicans were deported to Mexico and blamed, blamed, take blame for the depression. Vast number of those were actually naturalized American citizens. There is nothing new uh, under the sun here that's being exploited in a xenophobic way and exploited uh, by white leaders who give support to fringe white supremacist groups in America. This is not new. As you'll hear from our panelists tonight, at the Open Society's Justice Initiative, as this new report shows, we're here again at a perilous juncture uh, as this administration attempts to shrink American citizenship and strike fear in immigrant communities and among the naturalized. Researchers found that the Trump administration's denaturalization cases are targeting naturalized citizens based on country of origin data, which serves as a proxy for race, ethnicity, and of course, religion. Under this administration, the largest proportion of denaturalization cases target citizens from South Asia, Mexico, Haiti, uh, and those who are of Nigerian descent. On average, there have been more annual denaturalizations in the Trump administration than under the previous eight White House administrations. A tool once reserved, as Jim noted, for war criminals is now increasingly being used for immigration enforcement and to stoke the fear previously described. We know so very little about how this tool is being used in America today. The media is not asking this question. Congress is not asking this question. Local governments and local uh, states' uh, assemblies are not taking up uh, the proper interrogation of the use of this tool. The current administration is also diverging from past practice in its more aggressive approach to denying and revoking American passports, which can have the same effect as denaturalization. The government is, is, is expending greater and greater resources to try cases, even though the vast majority of those cases end up in affirming actual citizenship. It's an act of terror. These findings are an affront to the core ideas of the 14th Amendment. They should alarm and appall and activate all of us. American citizens are American citizens, no matter if they got here by birth or by naturalization. We are all equal and we are not, we are not going to endorse, validate, or stay silent in the face of an administration that is attempting by the hour to create a second class citizenship. So what are we doing here? We're having a conversation but we're not uh, just going to speak to the choir. We intend to take these findings into uh, our state assemblies and into the halls of Congress. And we're going to call for a federal moratorium on denaturalizations. The federal government should not open any additional cases until we know and can be assured that there is independent oversight and safeguards. We also need more research on the potential unequal applications and effects of the increasing use of this tool, particularly and most acutely on communities of color. The US government should not be revoking the passports of US citizens, and we need additional protections that address discrimination in the revocation of those passports. For example, all individuals must have a right, a fundamental right to counsel. The burden of proof to demonstrate non-citizenship should be on the government, not on everyday citizens. So we're having an important dialogue here, uh, but we hope through this report, through the work of all of your uh, organizations, uh, we're going to put these findings uh, in the streets uh, in ways that are animated uh, and that can build some real accountability around these issues. So I want, if I can now, to uh, introduce into this uh, conversation uh, our moderator uh, for the evening. Uh, and this is somebody who has worked uh, intentionally at the cross-section of uh, public policy and uh, citizen uh, action. 
Uh, Amanda uh, uh, Barron is an attorney, policy strategist, and writer with expertise in immigration law and policy and gender-based violence. She currently serves as a consultant for the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. She worked at the, at the Department of Homeland Security for nearly a decade, including senior positions of Chief of Public Engagement at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and most recently, Principal Director of Immigrant Policy for the Department's Office of Policy. You have to love government titles. In 2011, Amanda served as senior advisor uh, in uh, the administration that I worked in, uh, in uh, the White House's initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, where she focused on immigration, civil rights, and women's rights, and engaged with community leaders across the country. Prior to joining the federal government, Amanda was a staff attorney with Legal Momentum's Immigrant Women Program. She received her law degree from the University of Houston and obtained dual degrees in government and English from the University of Texas at Austin. Amanda is a naturalized U.S. citizen who immigrated here when she was a child. Uh, so you know by that lengthy intro that this is someone uh, who's equipped to moderate a conversation about the inside strategy and the outside strategy. Amanda, please. Thank you, uh, Jim and Patrick, for that great opening and scene setting. And um, I was wondering if my panelists could just join me up on the um, on the dais here. We can maybe start the program. Um, again, I wanted to thank Jim and Patrick um, and for the Open Society Foundations for hosting this important event and for all of you for attending today. Uh, my name, uh, like Patrick said, is Amanda Baran, and I'm a policy attorney and consultant for the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. And again, in my previous life, I served as um, an official at the Department of Homeland Security, but I left in 2017. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm joined here by these wonderful panelists. I'm going to start all the way over there with Laura Bingham. Uh, Laura Bingham is the Senior Managing Legal Officer for Equality and Inclusion in the Open Society Justice Initiative, and she is the co-author of the report that we're here to discuss. Uh, next, we have Manar Wahid, who is a Senior Legislative and Advocacy Counsel at the ACLU, uh, where she works on the intersection of issues impacting Muslims, Arabs, Middle Easterners, and South Asians. She was previously the Deputy Policy Director for Immigration in the Obama White House and was also the Policy Director for South Asian Americans Leading Together. And last but not least, we have Mariam Saleh. She is an editor and reporter at The Intercept, where she focuses on immigration and politics. Uh, she has been at the forefront of writing about the war on immigrants, and her writing has taken deep dives into a number of important issues on immigration including immigration enforcement, detention, and denaturalization. So thank you all for being here. Um, and just one housekeeping note, I'm sure you will have a lot of questions, and I encourage you to jot them down, um, keep them up here. Um, we're going to hold them until after we're done with the panelists, and then we'll have an opportunity to ask questions then. So I'm just going to jump in, Laura, with you first. Um, you co-wrote this excellent, excellent report. Uh, congratulations on its publication. You scoured uh, cases around the country. So I wanted to ask you, what did you discover about the current administration's denaturalization efforts and denial and revocation of passports? And what surprised you most about what you learned? So um, let me just uh, talk a little bit further in more depth about what we did when we were, how we scoured the cases. Um, because it's not really easy actually to find out what's going on and to find out where the cases are happening. So for denaturalizations, for example, we found 168 cases that were filed um, by the Department of Justice in 2017 and 2018. But in order to do that, you have to search every um, individual district court database uh, of using a number of different codes um, in a system that not everyone has access to. Uh, and then have to go through each individual file in that um, case record to really get a sense of what's going on. So this took a massive amount of efforts, uh, and we had uh, luckily a lot of help from pro bono attorneys to help us do that scouring. Um, we also went to South Texas to speak with people uh, who had lost their passports. 
uh, had them revoked, had them denied. We spoke to attorneys who worked on those cases, some of them for uh, more than a decade, more than 200 cases. Um, and we also analyzed the affirmative cases that have to be brought in order to challenge passport denials or revocations. The individual who's affected by this phenomenon has to actually affirmatively go into federal court and sue the government to claim that they're a citizen. Um, and, uh, and we looked at the number of cases that were filed in a period between 2014 and 2016, and again 2017 through 2019, 64% increase. And that's just the people who can, who can afford an attorney to bring such a case. Um, in the denaturalization uh, sphere, some of the surprises. Uh, Patrick mentioned that there were three times as many civil cases. That's a civil, there are two statutes, a civil statute and a criminal statute that allow the federal government to proceed against a naturalized citizen and revoke their citizenship. In the civil sphere, uh, three times as many cases were filed in 2017 and 2018 as compared to the average under the past eight administrations. That was a surprise, even though we knew that the operations that we'll talk about in a little more depth were amplifying these efforts. Um, the fact that there, were two, there was a $200 million budget request uh, to staff 500 new staff people, investigators and attorneys, to prosecute these cases with the aim of 1,600 cases um, filed just in uh, one, for one operation. And I'll describe that operation just in a little bit more depth. Uh, it's called Operation Janus originally, Operation Second Look under the Trump administration. This is a, uh, an effort to digitize old fingerprint records that were used in old immigration cases. And when I say old, I mean decades, I mean the 90s, the 80s, the average number, uh, the average um, date of naturalization uh, for the cases that we looked at. Um, so when the person was naturalized, who was then denaturalized under the Trump administration, um, was 10 years. Uh, but the, the longest running cases go back 24 years. Um, so these are really old pieces of evidence that are now being digitized, uploaded into a database, and scanned against more recent fingerprint files uh, that the government has. And whenever there's a match, uh, however imperfect that evidence was when it was collected, uh, the, the government can open an investigation and proceed. They're looking at 700,000 files. Um, and so the arbitrariness of that, um, the, the, of what the government, the reason why the government could initiate an investigation against naturalized citizens really struck us. And then I'll just finish by running through a few of the procedural protections that are lacking, which we highlight in the report that was a real shock. Um, there's no right to counsel in the civil proceedings. So many of them, up to 25% of the cases, there was no attorney. Uh, many people, a surprising number of people, may have been denaturalized already in absentia. Uh, we've, we looked at the country of origin information, uh, like Patrick was saying, um, that revealed the statistic that up to 49% of the denaturalizations in the cases that we looked at, uh, the person was um, of South Asian origin. But also, many of those same countries with the highest percentage of denaturalizations uh, have a ban on dual nationality. That means that when the person naturalized here and became a citizen in the US, there's a strong likelihood that they lost their second nationality. So the US government is producing statelessness by, uh, through, this, uh, through these operations. And in speaking with people and doing some investigation around what, how does the government even identify that, we discovered that there is a woeful absence of understanding of the, the phenomenon of statelessness. There's no definition in US law. Um, to help guide prosecutors or investigators to have a plan for what might happen. And the last thing I'll say for now is that when um, denaturalizations happen in general, whether they render someone stateless or not, it's virtually impossible to find out what happens to the person who's affected. So, Minar, um, I wanted to know, um, you know, Patrick touched on this, Laura touched on this, um, the administration has definitely ramped up denaturalizations, but how outside of the norm is this? Um, can you t give us a little history of denaturalization in America and 
how what's happening now compares historically? Sure. So um, first, I just want to give a big thanks to Open Society for hosting this and to really putting the work into this report. Laura and Natasha worked endlessly on this, and it is something that we at the ACLU grappled with, trying to figure out like how many of these cases are actually happening when the Department of Justice is no longer putting out press releases for all of them. They're just kind of selectively putting them out. And we didn't have the ability to do it, to like really go from state to state and pull case files and look at them and see what happens. So I think this report is really excellent and it's, I'm hoping gonna actually help people understand how much of a difference this is from what had happened before. Um, so to that point, you know, I think one of the things, just to kind of step back for a second, Citizenship is one of the most kind of like sacred and valued rights in the United States. It is not easy to go through the immigration process and to become a citizen. And as someone who was born here, I didn't have to do or know any of the things that people are expected to do when they go through a naturalization process. The level of documentation, the paperwork, which like anyone who's filled out a government form ever knows how awful paperwork is with the government. And then like all of the background checks, there are people that wait over 20 years in an immigration process to become citizens. And so then once they have that, there is a level of security that is expected once you are American. Um, there is the right, you know, there are rights and responsibilities that come with being a citizen. You can run for certain offices that you couldn't run for before. And then of course, as Patrick mentioned, the right to vote is a huge part about being an American citizen. And this is the taking away of rights from Americans. And so in that way, it is something that this administration that has been consistently targeting immigrants, um, communities of color, this is in a way such a drastic version of that because they're coming after Americans. Um, I think in terms of the, the history and what we've seen before, so denaturalization has always been a very rare and drastic measure that's taken in the most severe of circumstances. Um, you know, war criminals, um, people who are, try war criminals who are trying to hide their identities by changing their names, right? That's kind of the level of what we've seen before. And for decades, it's been 11 or 12 per year, right? And while that doesn't, well, three times 11 or 12 might sound like, oh, it's still just like 30 or 40. Every single one of those people is American and is having that stripped of them without necessarily a fair process, without like a real basis. We don't have the information to even know really what a lot of these claims are because they are not being disclosed. And it definitely goes against the grain of kind of the legal norms and the protections that have been set for decades and decades in terms of how rare this, this is. Um, the Supreme Court itself has said that lies, they've even said lies, um, are not enough to take away someone's citizenship unless it is material to them becoming a citizen somewhere in their procedure or in their application, right? So like what they called like small omissions or minor lies. And I think it's pretty dramatic to use the word lie as though it like it may have actually been deliberate. But if it's not, if it's not part of the decision making on the citizenship, it doesn't matter in terms of denaturalization. And so that I think really sets the tone for how rare this is supposed to be. Um, so now we're seeing like this rapid increase and um, thanks to our friends here, we know that it's like three times in the civil, in the civil procedural system what it was before. And then I really want to like pull out one of the things that Laura said um, about the numbers, right? So this administration has said various numbers at various points and they really kind of use Operation Janus and Second Look, um, which, are, which is that digitization of fingerprints issue as cover to say, it's not a lot of people. This is just about digitization. We're just fixing. We're just fixing the system, right? And I think that what what they've what they've shown, right, and what they're actually doing is that seven hundred thousand number that they indicated just quietly in a bu budget request to Congress. That's a huge number of Americans to investigate. We're talking about eleven or twelve people per year, and they're investigating seven hundred thousand in a year. Is what they're that's their goal, right? That's their target. Um, and $200 million that they were seeking to transfer. So whatever numbers they say out there in the public, that, that budget request, that indication, I think really tips their hand and shows who they are and what it is they're trying to do here. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I think what we're also seeing is, um, is kind of this, this, tar this 
message is being sent to the American public um, and to immigrants writ large of whether or not you're ever really able to be American or belong here, no matter what your process, no matter what hoops you jump through, and no matter how legitimate and secure your process was, what they're trying to say is, you're not really safe here, and if you're an immigrant, maybe you never really can be American. Thank you. Um, Mariam, I wanted to turn to you. So your reporting has covered some individual cases that have actually gone to court. Um, and I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about these cases and how they got to this point where they're being litigated and maybe describe what you've been seeing in the courtroom. It has been tremendously difficult to get information about these cases because as Laura mentioned, first of all, like tracking them down in the system that's called PACER is impossible. And it's also really hard um, once you find the case, you, most of the information is under seal online and you have to actually go to the courthouse to, to read the records to see what the government is claiming in these cases. So it's made it really difficult to learn about what's happening across the country. Um, that said, I've been mostly focusing on, in my reporting, on cases that were filed under Operation Janus, um, which Laura described a little bit. Um, and specifically, there were four cases that the Justice Department put out press releases and said, we are seeking to denaturalize these people under Operation Janus. The first three were announced in um, September 2017, almost two years ago to the date, and then a fourth um, in February of 2018. Um, and w only one of those cases so far has gone to trial. Um, it's the case of a man named Parvez Khan. He's a 62-year-old truck driver in um, Florida, and his case went to trial in Jacksonville in April. Um, and, you know, it was really interesting to me because it was the first one of these cases that the Trump administration was, like, very loudly proclaiming, we're seeking to denaturalize this guy. He shouldn't have become a citizen. He obtained his citizenship fraud fraudulently. And I wanted to see what that looked like once they actually went to court um, and, and fought the case. And I think, so it was a day-long trial in April. And one of the most striking things to me sitting in that courtroom was, I just can't believe how much energy and resources the Justice Department is expending to take this guy's citizenship away from him. He's somebody, he came to the U.S. in 1991, um, he came from Pakistan, he had a passport that, um, it was a fake passport, there was a um, fake photo on there, he was stopped at the airport, um, detained by immigration officials, sent to a jail, he spoke Urdu, there's nobody else in the jail who spoke Urdu, he got in touch with a lawyer who only spoke English, put in an asylum application, and then got bonded out and joined his brother in Miami. Never heard anything from immigration again. Um, apparently, his lawyer had gotten information about his court date for his asylum application. He didn't know about it. His lawyer's now dead, so we can't even hear from him. But we do know that his lawyer was suspended at some point by the California bar for um, poor communication with clients. It was an unrelated matter, but it just gives us a little bit of an idea of what kind of lawyer um, this guy was. And so Parvez is living in Miami, has no idea that he's missed this court date, has no idea that um, he's been ordered, deported from the country because he missed this court date. Um, 1997, marries an American citizen, applies for a green card. Um, it takes a while to get that, but he gets his green card eventually, and by 2006, he's a U.S. citizen. Um, he's a citizen without incident, um, no criminal history, no problems. Um, uh, and then in 2017, he gets this notice from the Justice Department that they're, they want to take his citizenship away from him. Um, and so, you know, it's been two years that they've been litigating this case. There's closing arguments in July, it still has not been resolved. It's probably going to result in an appeal. And so just thinking of it from that perspective, it's been two years of the Justice Department trying to make this man not an American. Um, and he's not somebody who was a war criminal, was not somebody who had committed crimes, was not anybody who posed any threat to the United States. Um, it was striking to see that there were top Justice Department lawyers um, in the courtroom on that day. So in addition to the lawyer who had been prosecuting the case throughout, um, there's the, the lawyer who oversees the division within the Office of Immigration Litigation that handles all the naturalization cases. He was at trial and he handled the questioning of some of the witnesses. 
And to me, that was an indication of how intent, you know, how important it was for them to win this case that they were sending the chief of this division um, to help in prosecuting the case. You know, their questioning of Parvez Khan's brother in particular was really aggressive and it was, you know, a little jarring to see that. And it seemed to, they, through their questioning about his tax returns and his marriages, it seemed like they were trying to send a message to him that perhaps he was not secure in his citizenship either. Um, so that was another thing I saw um, in my reporting on that. And, um, you know, it, it, appears that the judge in the case, her name is Patricia Barksdale, she's a magistrate judge, um, she's concerned about the ramifications of this. And she, in, um, during the closing arguments, was asking the government about what, the, what would happen to Mr. Khan if he were to lose his citizenship. Would he be deported right away? Um, and they claim that, you know, he could get his green card again. They have, which is, they don't know what ICE would do. But the reality is that ICE would have the power to then seek to um, remove him from the country once he's a green card holder anymore, once he no longer has the protections of U.S. citizenship. Um, but it was also apparent that she, you know, she was asking about these things, but the court has very little discretion in cases like this. And so if she finds that the government has met its burden, even though she seemed personally troubled by what the potential ramifications could be, there is not much she could do to consider that in making her decision. And that's still pending. Um, it'll probably be, it's been a month and a half since the closing arguments. At some point she said it might take two months for her decision to come down, but we're still waiting for that. I think so. Um, Laura, Mariam just spoke to the tremendous amount of resources like the government is putting into <clears throat> prosecuting these cases. Um, so we know it takes a lot for them to do that. And in fact, your report talks about just a few hundred cases of denaturalization and passport rev revocation. So, Given that, why should it matter for millions of naturalized citizens in the country at large when the number seems so small? So I think as I've been listening, and I, th I mean, Miriam, <laughs> the, the story to me is just absolutely chilling um, of this one person. And, and I think the, it's not just the attorneys in the, in the room prosecuting and intimidating his family members. I think the investment is also in order to send a message. Um, and that's, I'm just echoing things that people have said um, in a couple of ways already. Um, and the message is effective because citizenship is so symbolic. So we, we're talking about some really legal um, aspects of it, statutes and you know even the 14th Amendment. Um, but citizenship and belonging, these are really effective communication tools. And it's happening through a platform that the, the current administration has created around you know, using citizenship and immigration as a way to claim the mantle that actually it's the government who can tell people who's in and who's out. And the government gets to decide um, who is truly American and who's not. Um, and not only in the legal sense, but in that wider symbolic sense, what is the construction of the, the United States community? Um, and everyone should be terrified of a government wanting to take control of that kind of power because that is an authoritarian move. Um, and, and that's what, you know, I've, I'm steeped in this stuff. I've worked on citizenship and statelessness in many different countries um, and looked a lot at the theory and the great um, theorist of citizenship and statelessness is Hannah Arendt. And she lived through a period of totalitarian governments um, and the use and manipulation of citizenship laws um, in order to uh, exterminate people first from the, imagine, the legal imagination of the community and then permanently. Um, and she called denat the early denaturalizations that happened during her time easy precedents. And that's what I think of when I think of small numbers, because it's, it's just acclimating the American mind to the idea that eventually new policies could be introduced. And maybe they affect people with political views that are um, at the opposition to, to the opposition of the regime. Um, and that's not so far-fetched. 
because one of the things that really struck me in the, in the investigation that we did around this report was that the use of digitization has a new generation coming, that there's, uh, there are new integrated databases that will sweep in more information on more Americans. Right now, it's digitization of fingerprint files um, and some, some really close targets, right? And an arbitrary investigation that strikes fear in the heart of naturalized Americans. But five, 10, maybe even just two or three years down the road, the government might have a database, it's called the Heart Database Project, that sweeps in information on non-obvious relationships, that has facial recognition capabilities, that has DNA profiles of people. Um, these are all things that our government is intending to do. And some of the grounds for denaturalization include things like attachment to the Constitution um, or good moral character. And these are weapons now, and we have to understand them as such. So just because it's affecting a few people, uh, and still almost everyone I've spoken to who's a naturalized American already feels um, concerned. Uh, and most people who look at the findings of the report are, in fact, concerned, or if not appalled. Um, but the, these tactics can be redirected towards a wider swath of the population. Can I yeah. just, can I add something to that? So, like, to your point about, you know, the broader agenda and how this has played out in other places, I think it's important to put it in the context of what kind of the policies are that surround this that are also being pushed simultaneously, right? So obviously we have the targeting of black and brown people through this administration, immigrant or not, but also, you know, while these things are happening, while the denaturalization cases are being filed, there are also bills being introduced in Congress to um, end birthright citizenship. And those bills have been, been introduced for many years, but it's, it's, they're playing a long game, right? They introduce the bills, they introduce the bills, they seem really like kind of out of left field. Everybody's like, no big deal, they laugh at them. And we're moving closer and closer as they get normalized and as these denaturalizations increase into a moment where some of these things become possible. So things like ending birthright citizenship, things like expanding denaturalization grounds to include things like civil disobedience or um, membership in gangs, which has largely been used to target Latino populations. <clears throat> And so they're, they're kind of doing, there's like multiple things happening at once and they all connect and every one of these denaturalizations is relevant to that broader effort. Thanks, Farrar. And to kind of pick up on that, I wanted to turn to you, Mariam, and ask you, um, you've done a, a lot of great reporting on immigration um, and you've really focused on the broader kind of immigration policy strategy this administration is pursuing. So I wanted to ask like beyond citizenship can you connect some of this to the broader immigration policy that is being pushed by this administration? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's all interrelated and it's all part of a broader policy to make specifically brown and black immigrants um, unsafe or unwelcome in this country. Um, you know, the people who have been targeted for denaturalization belong to quote unquote special interest countries. That's like an ever changing list. There's no, you know, but. I think it's pretty easy for all of us to guess um, what those countries are. Um, you know, the report has found that majority of the people who have been targeted are from South Asia. There's also some overlap. Um, and when it comes to passport revocations, particularly with the Muslim ban countries, so like Yemenis, for example, have um, been one of the groups of people that have had their passports revoked and are now essentially being rendered stateless. Um, but it's also, you know, part of seeing like eliminating any form of permanent or even temporary protections for immigrants in this country, whether it's TPS, whether it's DACA, whether it's making it more difficult for people to, to get asylum. Um, and it's all part of a broader strategy and we see it targeted. It, you know, very little of it is impacting um, white immigrants to the United States. These are all policies, um, even if they appear facially neutral, are in effect um, impacting um, people of color and immigrants of color. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned special interest countries. Um, Manar, I'm wondering if you could talk about what you're seeing in terms of who's being affected and if you see a pattern to the government's targeting. So, I mean, I think, you know, one of the challenges until we had this report was figuring out, like, who is actually being targeted. If you, you know, even just looking piecemeal at the cases, you can tell that 
who the government is targeting is consistent with the fear-based narrative that they're pushing, right? So if you take, for example, um, the, the incident in New York City with, on Halloween almost two years ago now with the person who drove the truck into the crowd and um, killed eight people and injured 11, I think. So that individual, um, President Trump quickly jumped into that narrative. The person came on a diversity visa. Trump was also looking and the Trump administration was looking to eliminate the diversity visa process and proposing that in Bells on the Hill. And then what, within days, they filed, and they did a big press hoopla about it, they filed um, denaturalization cases against four family members, for people of the same family who came on diversity visas. So that's what I mean by like kind of that strategic agenda. And, if, and those people, I think, were Somalian, if I remember correctly, which is also consistent with kind of the Muslim ban countries. Um, I think the other thing that the report is able to show us is that you know, we see the targeting, as you mentioned, of South Asian countries, um, particularly Pakistan and Bangladesh have high numbers, um, Mexico, Haiti, Nigeria. All of these are consistent with attacks that the administration has made and their agenda to kind of rid this country of black and brown immigrants. I don't know, Laura, if you have anything you would add. I'm mostly quoting your report. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think also if the government is going to launch investigations that are relying on government data. Um, there are biases and errors written in um, to a lot of that information. Um, and it also, and those biases and errors tend to impact um, black and brown people, people from poorer countries, people with less means. Um, and, and that will continue and amplify. Um, I think that's, that's something that, that uh, really concerned me in researching the report. Um, and it also, there's also a kind of a reconfiguration of, uh, as we've been saying, the way that the bureaucracy and administration around these practices um, is conducting itself. So um, there's, there used to be uh, kind of specific themes, war criminals, you know, the worst of the worst cases, and people who were sitting, standing by ready to, um, to be activated. Now it's a proactive targeting and looking for errors and tiny mistakes that people have made. Um, and so I, I think that any time that the government switches around to that mode, mm -hmm. uh, then the most vulnerable, the most marginalized communities are the first hit. Um, Laura, so you've done a lot of work internationally, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the global context and maybe discuss how these policies compare to policies in other countries. Like, has this happened elsewhere? What the outcome has been? Yeah, so um, one, one country that some of, the, some of the discussion we've had today actually really reminds me of, and uh, Jim mentioned at the, at the beginning, is Kenya. Um, and that's because so we've worked with uh, minority groups in Kenya who struggle with proving that they are truly Kenyan. Um, and there are a lot of uh, bureaucratic and paper-based reasons behind that. Um, but there's a process under which um, specific groups on an ethnic and religious basis have to present more evidence um, than anyone else, just from the outset. Um, they're recognized by their name, they're recognized by where they live, and they always have to produce um, additional proof. Um, and there's virtually no limits on how much proof they're required to give. Uh, and this is all extra legal, so it all happens before the actual process of applying for a passport or some other document. Um, and so in some of the passport cases that we looked at, the practice, even before someone's passport is denied or revoked, they have, the, the, the Department of State, which administers all this, can just send a letter saying, oh, you know, can you give us your grandparents' birth certificates? Can you go back to 1930 census records? And, can, you know, can you spend $80 and procure those for us and show that someone in your family appears in them just to, to, to build some kind of case? Um, to say that that person was born in the United States. And this is even, you know, maybe decades after the person has been living as a born U.S. citizen their entire lives. 
Um, so we see cases like that a lot in a lot of other contexts where um, there's no, the, the government has given absolutely no reason to trust the data that they have, and yet there's so much arbitrariness that at any moment they could point to someone and say, provide additional proof that you are actually a citizen. Um, and the burdens are all on the individuals. So I think some of those cases really resonate here, and it was shocking, actually, to see how much discretion and how little information there is, how little transparency there is, and how poorly our government keeps records of these important, permanent um, things that they're doing that affect Americans. Uh, and then in some of the other contexts um, that we work in where, that you might have seen in the headlines, Myanmar, Jim also mentioned the, the Rohingya minority in Myanmar. So Myanmar's citizenship law um, is a, a product of um, a, a founding myth, a, like a lot of other countries. And that myth is that there are certain specific, there must be certain specific national races. It's race-based, um, and if we don't stick to those categories, um, that, are, that are written into the 1982 citizenship law, um, then the union will completely fall apart. Um, and because the Rohingya are not a part of that construction, um, that made it so much easier for successive uh, military leaders to gradually strip away their rights um, and leave them in a, in a state of exception. Um, and so when we talk about the meaning of citizenship here and how our union is constructed, constructed and the meaning of the Constitution, how we interpret the 14th Amendment, once you interject the idea that there are specific kinds of people who meet that description and that they must do in order to hold some kind of nation together, then you're entering into that kind of territory. Um, so. Again, we're talking about small numbers, but we're talking about really big bedrock ideas uh, that are getting distorted through the debates. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so, Minar, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about how terrifying a lot of this is. I'm wondering um, if you have some ideas for calls to action we can make to our legislators or other policymakers or other ways that people can get involved to kind of bring attention to this issue? Yeah. Um, so I think I will say based on my work on the Hill too, and I do a fair amount of lobbying with congressional offices, nobody's really focused on this. Nobody thinks that it's a big deal. The government is telling them this is digitization of fingerprints, which the report also shows that's not necessarily what the cases are, at least half of them, like 40 to 60 percent of them might be. Um, but the rest of them are not, right? And so you've got a lot of other cases in the mix as well. Um, I'm hoping this report is going to be very helpful actually in getting some members' offices to see how significant and dramatic this shift is and how it is really like impacting all of our country um, so that they can take action. Some of that action from my perspective, like for me, the first step needs to be that we need all the data. We need the information. We need to know what they're doing and how they're focusing their resources, right? So like Natasha and Laura scoured all the courts, right? But is there more? Like, are, we don't know if all the data is perfect, right? And so we need those numbers from the government. We need to know how many cases are they investigating? How many referrals are they doing for prosecution? Um, how many are actually ending up in denaturalization and what kind of, and do those people end up stateless? Um, and then within that, we need a breakdown. We need to know national origin, how they came into the country so we can see if they're targeting people like diversity visas, right? People that they don't, for programs that they don't want to exist, right? Or that diversity visas largely, um, people that come in through diversity visas are mostly people from African countries. So is that a target here? Like the grounds matter in that context as well. And kind of get that breakdown of what they're, what they're doing, who they're focusing on, and how many of these cases actually are there. And then the next step of that, I think, once we have all the data, is to look at what are the ways in which we can restrict this to go back to the standards that we had before. So does that mean... Um, limiting funding for the government to only be able to focus on certain types of denaturalization cases, right? 
And then like, what are different rights and protections we can put in place to better protect um, Americans? So are there, you know, like, Laura talked about the difference between civil and criminal cases. Like in a civil case, you don't have a right to a lawyer. Can we, can we add that into legislation? A right to a lawyer, a statute of limitations, so they can't do this 20 years after you become a citizen. Um, maybe higher burden of proof, because it's like lower in a civil proceeding, right? To really look at those and figure out like, how do we, how do we make this consistent um, with what it, not just what it has been in the past, but what it should be. Thanks. Um, Mariam, I'm going to end with you. Um, and I want to know what is the most important thing um, that you've learned from your reporting on these issues that you would want everyone else to know? I mean, I think it's something that's already been touched upon this evening, but it's the fact that even though the numbers may seem small, um, the consequences are actually really large um, for us as a country. And it got, I was thinking about this earlier today, and it reminded me of like, you know, in the fall of 2016, there was like this big push. People were like, you know, if you're a green card holder, you should apply for any are eligible for naturalization. You should become a citizen because that there was a sense of permanence that came with being a U.S. citizen. And people were worried that if Trump were elected, um, it might become more difficult for people who are not yet citizens to become citizens. Um, and, you know, for so long, you know, I think I used to work in, in immigration law and there's, you know, always this idea that like when you when your clients are green card holders up until up until the point that they become citizens, there is always a fear that they could um, be targeted for deportation if they get in any criminal trouble, if if whatever it may be. And that once they became citizens, they were more or less safe because denaturalization was reserved for such a small class of people, for people who had committed war crimes, who were connected to terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we see now with the Trump administration targeting these dozens of people, a few hundred people um, for denaturalization, it's not just about these people. It's not just about their families. It's not just about the fact that they may become stateless and all of that is huge, but it's also for all the other millions of people who are in the United States who became citizens by way of um, naturalization, who are not born here, who may never feel fully comfortable um, in the fact that they're American um, because of this threat that is now looming over all of our heads. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I think now we'd like to turn to all of you. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I think there, are there roving mics? Okay, great. So if you have a question, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, I'm gonna take a couple at a time um, and then we'll answer them. So let's do two or three at a time. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for the panel. Uh, Laura, I'm just curious, why did you have to go to these local jurisdictions and scrape this information out? Isn't there any way that you could go through Congress through its oversight function, whatever committees handle naturalization, whatever committees handle immigration, uh, you know, the various, I know it's very fragmented, but did you go that route? Because it just seems like an intensely labor an intense, a labor intensive process that's probably going to skew your sample a little bit too. Okay, great. Anyone else? Um, my question is almost like. I'm sorry, can you speak up? It is but a little bit. Uh, my question is that with the government taking action of. Um, denaturalizing citizens, those who are already citizens. Isn't it that part of our constitution? And if the constitution has not changed, why our court system allowing these administrations to take such action without the decision being made in general? We're talking about the House, the Senate, and everybody to sit down and to decide who they should de deport or not, or who they should take away their citizenship. Thank you. We have another. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your work. Uh, it's really so important. And I have a very pragmatic question. 
If you know of somebody who may be at risk of denuclearization and deportation, etc., what to do? What resources are available? Okay, thank you. Okay, Laura, um, I'll turn to you since we had the first question directed to you. About the <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so on finding information, um, so in addition to, uh, th there's no way to search existing databases um, other than how we did it. And um, as Mariam noted, even when you find cases that exist through the PACER system, uh, most of the civil cases are unavailable online, so you physically do have to go to the courthouse to locate the full docket, which is what we wanted, because otherwise you wouldn't really know what happens. Maybe you know the number of cases that are filed, um, but you wouldn't know the facts. You wouldn't know how it ended. You wouldn't know which government attorneys were representing. You wouldn't know this country of um, origin designation. Um, we also filed a FOIA request um, to a number of different government components seeking information, um, including prosecutions, disaggregated information on case numbers, also historical data, which is actually how we have that um, statistic on the number of cases, uh, civil cases now versus the past eight administrations. But, and that informa the, the, the information that we got through that request is now all up on a document cloud um, to, for the public to see. We hope we'll get more. Um, most of the request has yet to be responded to. Um, oversight is something that we are recommending um, in meetings with uh, staffers and members. As Menar said, and I think can speak to in more depth, um, there just is not the perception right now that this is a big problem. So that was hence the report. So what we do hope, and this is key in all of the recommendations that we make, is that actually this, uh, the, the hearings will happen. Um, congressional offices will send letters, make their own requests, um, that more information will come to light about these policies and practices. And I would just say on the last one, like we've drafted language for legislation, and there have been a couple of offices that have tried to get it into bills and have not been successful. Um, because it's not perceived as a, as a real issue right now, and there's fires all over every day that people are running towards. Um, and then, you know, Laura mentioned, like, the idea of a letter, like a member of Congress or maybe many being able to send a letter to, like, State Department and DHS and ask these questions. We've drafted that, too. So, I mean, I think what our hope is that this report is really going to help people understand that it's not this is a really big deal. Like three times the number of previous administrations is a really big deal. So I think that's something that we're definitely going to pursue. But I would also like recommend that anyone um, reach out to their members of Congress and help us pursue it too. They love to hear from constituents and to meet their <laughs> needs. Um, and I, just to respond quickly to the other question about um, basically the, the, the 14th Amendment and the fact that it says uh, that uh, citizens who are born or naturalized are equal, equally citizens. So how does, how does any of this pass muster? Um, and one answer, and I hope the other panelists will answer this too because it's, it's, it's complicated, um, is, but these proceedings, the, the um, civil and criminal proceedings are, even criminal proceedings, are construed um, by the, the U.S. government as administrative, not punitive. Um, that, and, and the whole idea here is that there's just been a mistake. And so the, it, the effect of someone being denaturalized is that it erases the fact that they were ever naturalized to begin with, le legally speaking. Um, and so it's, a, it's an end run around that. Um, but, the re but the Constitution still holds. And, uh, for a hundred years, uh, policy has been in place in the Department of Justice saying that this is a powerful tool, this is a radical tool, and so it should only be deployed when such an action would actually improve the lives or safeguard the lives of all of it that has a real high national interest um, because of the stakes, the constitutional stakes and the individual stakes. 
And I think that that shift as well, that's a policy memo from 1909. And we, we know for a fact that it was in effect until 2008. Um, the, the government seems to have uh, abandoned that approach. Um, and so all this whole body of evidence is really to say that we've also abandoned the equality of citizenship under the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, one thing I just add to that is that, you know, the statute that, or the statutes that the government is pursuing denaturalization under, they're not new statutes. They've been on the books for a long time. Um, and as Laura was saying, the intent is to like erase the fact that this person was ever a citizen. Um, and basically what they say is, you know, a person can be denaturalized if they should never have become a citizen in the first place, which means they, they lied or um, misrepresented something in the course of their citizenship application. And so that's, you know, tech, that's a technical language that the government is relying on in these cases. But we are seeing an expansion of the types of cases in which they're applying it, um, like Parvez Khan's case that I've been following. Um, a lot of what we know about Operation Janus, we know from a 2016 report that was put out by the Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General's office, where they kind of reviewed this process that had been going on under Obama. And one of the things that was pointed out in that report was that even though they were finding some discrepancies in cases of people who maybe had been ordered deported under a different name, um, was that they were going to be focusing on people who... Um, were in positions of public trust. So who had become citizens and then were like, you know, work, had some government clearance or something like that. Um, and, you know, those were the kinds of people that even under Obama when, Obama, when the Obama administration was investigating these types of cases, it wasn't just any random person who maybe was ordered deported once and then became a citizen. And so there was a, there was a public interest focus to that. And we've come, seen a complete erosion of that under Trump. I think so, oh, sorry, go I was just going to say on the last question. Is that yeah. where you were going? On the last question, yeah, what are, um, like, what resources are there for people at risk? And I'm just going to add on to that. Um, that, you know, we have seen a ramp up of the government pursuing these cases. Like, are there a lot of lawyers that are equipped to handle these cases to represent people and defend them, too, since it's, like, an emerging area right now? So, I mean, I think part of the challenge is that there's not a lot of lawyers with this expertise because this has never been a significant issue. Um, and so it's very different from kind of um, a regular immigration case in the sense that it's not necessarily immigration expertise. It's almost like a criminal proceeding, right? And many of these are criminal cases as well. Um, and so part of this is about developing that expertise um, so that people actually can get the representation that they need because it is an incredible number of hours to work on one of these cases. And it, they go on for quite a long time, as Miriam kind of pointed that out. And the results are, you know, you don't, they, they take a long time to get to the end of. I was actually going to plug your organization. Um, the ILRC has been, I thought that's what you were going to do. I was like, oh, go ahead. Um, the ILRC has actually been working on kind of, um, practice manuals and trainings for attorneys that are looking to take these on. So I think that's a good resource to go to, um, thinking about attorneys that can help. And then um, in the broader immigration scheme, I would say the New York Immigration Coalition, given that we're in New York. Okay, great. So any more questions? Yeah. I My last question is, during the naturalization, once you became a citizen, you must file with the Social Security Department, take your passport or your citizen certification to inform the, them that you became a U.S. citizen. So by this administration, uh, going through what they changing the computer system, is that going, is that applying to social security as well? Once they naturalize the people, are they taking the social security away? Because the only way you can find a person who is a citizen also, you go to the security office to find out about the cases of those people. Are they, or Trump administrations going also to take a people's social security away to denaturalize the citizens? 
Thank you. And we had some we had some questions up here. We could get a um, a mic up front. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, if the administration is making all this effort to denaturalize people, uh, I'm guessing you, they are making the same effort to uh, prevent people from becoming citizens in the first place. So one of my questions is surrounding uh, green card holders. Uh, I know that um, I say if you have a green card, there's a uh, uh, amount of time that you can stay outside of the country. Is those law changes? And if they change, how long, for instance, for somebody who's holding a green card can stay out of the country? Thank you. And we had one right here up front. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for the work that you've done on this report. Exceptionally important. Um, I'd like to ask you this question as um, a stateless person. I am a stateless person and I represent the stateless community here in the United States. And my question to you is, uh, what role can we play in this effort? As we are people who have lived this, who have lived lives as stateless, who have experienced the challenges. So that's the first part of my question. The second is, can you speak a little to your experience um, as you have investigated these cases, the stories I'm sure you've encountered, and uh, maybe you can open up a little bit about that, and thank you. So, the first question about um, what happens when you get denaturalized, do other government agencies, like the Social Security Agency, are they informed? Do they take away those benefits? I don't know if anyone has any insight into that. Well, one thing I was going to say, um, I mean, first of all, we don't know the full scope. Uh, I, I don't think that, my sense is I don't think that a lot of the government agencies always talk to one another. Some of them talk to each other a lot. Some of them don't. Um, but a lot of the cases um, that we looked at ended in plea agreements or consent agreements in civil cases. So basically, you know, the same thing, but in a civil context where um, the case settles. And uh, under the circumstances uh, of those cases, the, the defendant, the citizen, will sign away a lot of their rights. Um, and we've talked about the disparities in the evidence and the pressure and the family relationships that are involved in those decisions. Um, and in, in some of the decisions, they also submit to a, what's called a judicial removal order. Um, so they'll be fully removed from the United States, circumvent all of the defenses that might be available to them in immigration court, including asylum claims, um, any defenses to removal that they might have in their individual case. Um, and so I, I, I to the extent that people are surrendering so much of their lives here and being removed, um, you know, I think that that triggers their loss of many attendant um, rights and protections or, or physical access to them or recourses you know, to enjoy them. Okay, great. And then um, to the second question, so we see that the administration is putting a lot of resource into denaturalizing people. What kind of resources are they putting into preventing people from naturalizing in the first place? So, I mean, I think I would start with the fact that they are preventing people from coming into the U.S. to start with, right? So, whether it's the Muslim ban, the asylum ban, um, the drop in the refugee numbers, which is very significant, um, Visa numbers across the board have dropped substantially. So they're coming at this at every way possible um, and obviously targeting people of particular backgrounds. So I think there's that. And then I am not an expert in the naturalization piece, but I do know, and I don't know, Amanda, if you know more about this, that they're, they're very much slowing down that process mm -hmm. and not making as many grants and the time, the time periods for each case are much, much longer. Yeah, um, they're definitely the processing times for all applications and especially naturalization applications have grown longer and the backlogs are growing longer. And there was actually a couple months ago a hearing on um, 
these processing times in uh, the House Judiciary Committee did a whole hearing on the backlogs and processing times. So we know that they are trying to slow them down and they've added all of these different requirements like, oh, we have like no more vetting and you know we have other applications we're processing. So it's kind of like uh, by bureaucracy, intentionally they're using the bureaucracy to slow down these applications as, as well as like other applications. People have been waiting in some jurisdictions like two years for naturalization application. They vary. Um, on our website, the Immigrant Legal Resource Center, we do have like a whole map and we have like a, uh, a lot of resources about uh, the different like processing times and um, a lot of information about that. Um, just one, just one irony that I think should not should, <laughs> should not go unnoted. Um, in, we mentioned a couple of times that two hundred million dollar um, budget, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> it's it's not a request for fund; it's a request to reallocate funds. Actually, uh, this was for for this year, this fiscal year, twenty nineteen, um, from the fee examination account. Um, uh, into denaturalizations, and the, the, the fee, the immigration fee examination account is comprised of the fees that people pay when they apply for naturalization. Mm -hmm. So literally the government is taking that money and using it to denaturalize other people. Yeah. <laughs> and just to like put a fine point on that, I told you about that uh, hearing that they had on processing times where they hauled in government witnesses and all of them said, yes, we are backlogged. Yes, we have processing delays. Uh, they were shamed by legislature, le legislators about this. The very next day, the head of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the arm that does all of this work, sent out a call to its employees to go do long like details over at ICE. So they're taking away their adjudicators too and sending them over to ICE to do things while they're admitting that they don't have enough adjudicators or resources to process the applications that are coming in. And so just to be clear, <laughs> ICE is the enforcement agency. Yes. So they're taking people from immigration services and processing <laughs> and sending them over to enforcement, which is exactly what they were doing with that money. Right. Um, and then I just wanna um, make sure we get to the uh, question that you asked about um, state, the stateless community and how they can get involved. Yeah, um, thank you for that question and thank you for being here. Um, it means a lot to us. And I think um, you know, it's, it's actually kind of freeing to talk about the word stateless and have a few people on a panel know what I'm talking about um, because it's not, it, it's not really an issue that we think about, especially here. Um, because we do have protections and, and an inclusive citizenship regime. So um, the, the assumption for people who confront this topic of statelessness is, well, that's not a problem here. Um, and, and they don't, they have, they struggle to understand what it is. Um, and it's a challenge to put a, a human story behind it and face behind it, even though it's such a penetrating human rights violation to be stateless. Um, but me saying it is very different from you saying it. And so I think the way that you deploy your stories and the leadership and the, the courage to come out and speak about your story and your experience um, is so powerful in conversations like this. And we've, because Open Society Justice Initiative works on statelessness all over the world, um, we push this issue to the top of our agenda in this report. Um, but, but us doing it again, you know, we need that support and we need you standing right next to us. Um, detention is a big issue uh, for stateless people in the U.S. generally, um, not in, in outside of the denaturalization context. Um, so talking about the realities of what happens to stateless people here is important, and when we talk about the, the periods of detention, um, the, the, the black hole that people disappear into, um, the, the situation that's like statelessness um, that happens to people in these contexts, um, it's so important to be standing next to you guys. So I think we have time for like two more questions. Hi, I have about sort of three questions, but they're all related. 
Um, <laughs> so I looked around the room when it was crowded, and I saw that about two or three of us who are over 65, maybe. And my question, the first part is, do you hear from people over 65, McCarthy, 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 from older people who remember the McCarthy era? Do you ever hear that? OK, great. Um, I think there's a question up front. Well, I, was, I had a related question. Oh, sorry. We're going to take them all. All right. In, Let me just quickly get it out. Do you, you, you go to court, you're either talking to people or you're observing. What do the judges say when they're not on court? What do they say when they're standing in line, when they're in the elevator? What do the opposing lawyers say to you? What do the people opposing you, what do they think? Do they make comments? Because when I talk to Republican legislators in Pennsylvania, I hear different stuff privately than I hear publicly. Thank you. I think she had a question right here. And okay, great. Hi, thank you, everybody. I'm currently going through the naturalization process, so I, I will let you know. Or I'll send a postcard from, from Zambia that it didn't work out very well. But my question um, is, um, you know, obviously I think most people in the room hope that this administration will change sooner rather than later, but it will change. Um, what do you think are going to be the long-term ramifications of what this administration is doing? and structural changes that will endure beyond. Great. Um, and I think we'll end on that question. Oh, do you want one more? OK. There's been a lot, sorry. <laughs> There's been a lot of talk about the 14th Amendment. And it was, of course, as you know, instituted for freed slaves, not for people who come over the borders the, with pregnancy and then have children over here. So there's a lot of talk about changing the 14th Amendment so that it no longer covers anybody who's pregnant who happens to trip into the country. That's a very real um, significant issue. OK. Um, let's go with the first question about, um, like maybe, Mariam, if you know, you've been in courthouses and have heard maybe things off the record, if you want to share any of these things that you've heard. Yeah, I mean, the judge and her staff remain very tight-lipped. Um, government attorneys refused to talk to me. I um, went up to one of the attorneys who was prosecuting the case. I tried to ask him a couple of questions. He gave me the email address for the Justice Department spokesperson who declined to answer my questions. <laughs> um, I was also, during the trial, I was trying to get a sense of who was in the room. There were like three people in the room and I was one of them. There was a lawyer I knew. Um, and there was another woman who was sitting there the entire time and I saw her talking to the Justice Department lawyers before and after the trial and I was curious who is this person who's sitting in the audience I went up to her, I was literally standing right next to her. She was like looking in the opposite direction as if she didn't see me. I was like, hey, excuse me, can you mind, you know, I'm a reporter, just wondering who you were. She completely ignored me. And so that's like, that's the way that the government is operating in these cases, completely, you know, avoiding the press and not answering questions. Thank you. Um, and I, I really love that question and I have a lot to say about it, but I won't I'll <laughs> let the panelists talk about it. But what are the long-term consequences of the administration's like war on the immigration system and uh, yeah so i don't have a great answer here in that i think it's i think that what they have done already and what they did very rapidly i mean they're they're moving very quickly because they're disregarding laws right they're disregarding the constitution they're dismantling our immigration system piece by piece by piece, right? It's death by a thousand cuts. And I think pulling all of those systems, like re-initiating really the refugee system, it takes two years for somebody in the process for to become a refugee to actually come to the United States. And that system has been ground to a halt. So, and those um, employees that do that work who work in refugee, um, in the refugee processing division, are no longer really doing that work, right? So when you look at each system and how they've really quickly dismantled it, I think it's going to take us many years to get back to where we were before we can even begin to move forward to somewhere better. Because that wasn't the ideal either. Yeah, and I, 
like Bernard, I spent 10 years at DHS in various parts of it and just rolling back all of the regulations back to where, like unrolling them, you know, going back to the policies we had, that's going to take a long enough time. What really scares me and keeps me up at night is the culture change that has happened at these places because now people are feeling empowered to, you know, speak their minds and, you know, when we have another president and a new administration, those people will still be there. And a lot of new folks who have come in will also have been, you know, they've learned under that kind of new regime. So the culture change is going to be something that's I'm really kind of nervous about moving forward. So I think it's going to take a lot of time. And I think the detention system and like seeing children in cages, like that is such a real example of what you're talking about because the D, like the way that, the way that government employees in those situations, whether it's CBP or ICE, are treating people is like they're not people. How do you rehumanize people mm -hmm. after they have behaved that way? And that I think is a really hard thing. Right. So I think we're going to end on that note. Ooh. Um, <laughs> No, is that well, think, let me let me just try, let me just try to make a, a positive note. No, because because I think so. I am. I mean, I am concerned when I think about structural changes, also about the way our legislature has worked in recent times. You know, because what we're asking for are legislative changes, and what that what the opening might be, like trying to come out of this period under the current administration. You know, maybe this is a moment when we can actually institute sweeping changes in the right direction. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the fight, but I'm concerned at, about the mechanics of um, the way that we write laws today. Um, and I think what we wanted to do with this report really was to provide a tool for some of the coming debates. And, and if you look back at the history, you know, McCarthyism, Red Scare, um, these debates about the 14th Amendment and um, whether it applies to everyone, you know, this has happened before. And we've overcome it and made some really actually positive changes. Um, and so I, we wanted to show those arcs and valleys um, to give people a sense of forward momentum and something to draw on for the coming debates and discussions. Um, so maybe that's a little bit more positive, but I, what we need is energy. You know, we need energy I'll and information. That. And that's that what is, we're trying to do. That's definitely a better <laughs> note to end on. Um, so I wanted to thank you again, Laura, Bernard, and Mariam for this and for the Open Society Foundations and to all of you for coming. Um, let's give them a round of applause. Um, thanks so much, um, and please have a nice evening.